Hey team, Dr. Jack Audy here, and in this video, I'm going to cover the discovery of Alzheimer's disease. Now, if you need a little primer on Alzheimer's disease, I'll check out my previous video on dementias. And in this video, we're going into the discovery of the most common dementia um, that we find in the world, and that is Alzheimer's disease. And it's involving these two uh, people here. We've got Eloise Alzheimer's the the physician and August Dieter, the first patient um, ever really recognized to have Alzheimer's disease. It obviously wasn't called Alzheimer's disease until later, but she was really the keystone patient that led to the discovery of Alzheimer's disease. So let's jump into it. It all starts at this rather nice looking building with this nice ish name um, but you've got to remember this is all happening around the turn of the 20th century so around 1901 to 1906 was when the major discoveries for alzheimer's disease happened and all happened at this place here and this german name roughly translates to asylum for lunatics and epileptics so obviously we have a bit more pc names going on but this is where Eloise alzheimer's worked and this is where he met august dita so here's august dita here um it's amazing that they have a photo and i think almost in this photo you can see what's going on right you can almost see that things aren't right so she was 51 years old when she was committed now that is very young for alzheimer's disease patients uh, typically around about six percent of uh, people between the age of 70 and 75 are diagnosed with alzheimer's disease and about 33 percent of people over the age of 85 are diagnosed with alzheimer's disease so it's very much an age-related disease that we don't typically see in this young person but it's quite important that she was young because it meant that Eloise alzheimer's noticed her you know it was a very unusual thing to have someone this young with um dementia essentially she was incredibly forgetful and confused uh, she had dramatic mood swings and so her husband committed her to um, uh, this place uh, Eloise was intrigued because of her young age and her documented the decline so just few a few years earlier she, her husband said she was completely normal and fine um, and had no cognitive deficits at all so um Eloise Alzheimer's was incredibly intrigued by her decline, noting that she didn't drink alcohol at all and had no head injury. So it was a very peculiar case to have this kind of cognitive deficits and the progression of it uh, without any other sort of external factor going on. Now, I think you can almost best encapsulate the symptoms by just reading a conversation between Eloise Alzheimer's and August Dieter. And it goes like this. What is your name? August Family name, August. What is your husband's name? She hesitates and finally answers, I believe August. Your husband? Oh, my husband. Pause. How old are you? 51. Where do you live? Oh, you have been to our place. Are you married? Oh, I'm so confused. Where are you right now? Here and everywhere. Here and now. You must think badly of me. Where are you at the moment? We will live there. Where is your bed? Where should it be? You can see she's very confused and she can't access her memories very well at all. And I can imagine it's so distressing having these kind of cognitive symptoms going on. Um, you can see that she's uh, trying to answer the question even though her memory isn't there. And she's trying to fill in some details and maybe skirt around the answer. You know, you've been there is where, where I live. And and this is very typical um, in in Alzheimer's patients, it's a process called confabulation. So after five years, she died of an infection in bed sores in 1906. And this again is actually really typical for Alzheimer's disease. Um, the average uh, uh, expected lifespan after diagnosis is five years. So on average, five years after being diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, the patient typically dies. Um, and uh, it's often very, it's often a difficult diagnosis because uh, Alzheimer's disease does progress and they do end up with motor deficits, which can cause frailty and lack of movement. Um, but often it's, it's the frailty plus another thing eventually um, results in their death. So a bed sore is really typical, um, an infected bed sore or pneumonia. Um, but you can also just straight up die from Alzheimer's disease, essentially from a loss of move, movement function, inability to eat properly, etc., and look after yourself. So Eloise Alzheimer's um, uh, 
eventually uh, after she died he asked for her brain now there was a bit of a deal going on here the husband couldn't actually afford to keep her in the facility and wanted to take her out and put her into much worse facility with worse care um, and Eloise Alzheimer's made an arrangement where she could stay in the much better facility and be looked after really well if he could look at her brain to try and figure out what is going on here. So after she died, um, as, as per agreed, he got access to her brain and performed an autopsy. And then he sectioned the brain and did histological stains on it. Now it was here in these histological stains that Eloise Alzheimer's identified the three histological hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease. One is extracellular protein aggregates, right? So extracellular means outside the cell. Protein aggregates means proteins that have clumped and tangled together and essentially have become insoluble. So they now fall out of solution. They're not sort of bioavailable floating around. They're now out of solution as an insoluble plaque. Here we can see one right here. This is called an amyloid plaque. And amyloid is the name of the protein that mostly makes up these protein aggregates. In my next video, I'm going to cover everything about amyloid and all that kind of stuff. So here we can see a large extracellular protein clump. Interesting thing about this glass slide is it's actually Eloise Alzheimer's glass slide. Um, they found it in the basement of Munich University and they took photos of it and published it in the late 90s. So this is actually genuinely created by Eloise Alzheimer's, which is super interesting. And here's a neuron here just to give you the size scale. This is a plaque. Now plaques can actually get much bigger than this um, and be the size of several neurons, dozens of neurons. So they can get very big. And now these, yeah, insoluble protein tangles in the extracellular space. There's another feature here, and this is intracellular tangles. You can see it a little bit here. So normally, um, the proteins in a cell have a very specific linear structure, right? And these are the highways of the cells. They are the structure of the cytoskeleton of the cells, and in neurons, they're very well organized. But what we see in Alzheimer's disease is intracellular protein tangles. So this time, it's in the cell, and it's a protein tangle. So this is a neuron right here. And here we can see these protein tangles here. Now these are called neurofibrillary tangles. NFT, neurofibrillary tangles right there. And that basically you can think of it as a protein, a large protein tangle outside the cell and a smaller protein tangle inside the cell. They're made up of different proteins. This one's mostly made up of amyloid and this one's mostly made up of tau, T-A-U. The last histological, sort of the forgotten cousin, I would say, um, the last histological um, feature of Alzheimer's disease um, was drawn by Eloise Alzheimer's, but largely ignored for about 90 years. So um, this was his drawing, P is for plaque there, and that's the amyloid plaque there. And he described these clusters of non-neuronal cells that surrounded the plaque. And these clusters of non-neuronal cells turned out to be inflammation. Now, this inflammatory histological hallmark was largely ignored for 90 years or so, but now it's becoming very a very interesting topic of conversation and it's something I research. Now, I will release a video on that if you want to check out a video about me, my research around the inflammatory contribution to Alzheimer's disease. Now, one of the remarkable things about this discovery was the correlation of neurological symptoms and histological features that had pretty much never been done before, right? And this is hard to explain, but we are now very effective at treating um, psychological conditions, right? Um, you know, it's not perfect, but we are much, much better at managing psychological conditions. In the past, insane asylums were everywhere, and they were called that. Um, that's why I use that term. Um, and they were everywhere. And then after the development of modern um, antipsychotics, um, we, uh, we dramatically reduced that number. And so we shut down a lot of these mental institutions. And so that's why they always feature in haunted movies and et cetera. Um, but critically, the people with the psychological conditions, when we looked in their brains using histology, we didn't see anything different, right? Um, a schizophrenic brain is going to be very using Eloise Alzheimer's technique is going to be identical to a healthy brain. And this has been seen over and over again. There had never been a correlation between a histological feature and a neurological symptom until Eloise Alzheimer's came along. 
So that's one of the major discoveries there was he identified these three histological hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease and he associated it with the condition, the symptoms. He, he actually came across another patient, same symptoms, same histological hallmarks. He then, this is the one piece of humor in the whole thing, he then went to present it at a conference and the hall was packed to the gills. Um, and it was, it was packed not because they wanted to hear Eloise Alzheimer's, it's because they wanted to hear the lecture after Eloise Alzheimer's. And the topic of that lecture was compulsive masturbation. So everyone was there to hear that lecture. And so when Eloise Alzheimer's finished his talk, he was rushed off stage and no one asked any questions about his seminal discovery of the most common dementia in the world. It's kind of sad, isn't it? A little bit too. Right, it wasn't really until his boss put it into a textbook and called it Alzheimer's disease that it became well known and widespread and this resulted in the birth of the diagnosis that is Alzheimer's disease. So in the next video, I'm going to go into an introduction into Alzheimer's disease um, where we can talk about the pathophysiology going on um, underneath. Thanks, Dean.